All right, fruit lovers, this is Ross. In today's video, I'm gonna give you guys a number of fantastic recommendations of different fruiting plants that I think you guys ought to grow in your own backyard orchard. And in fact, we're not just gonna talk about the different species of fruiting plants or the different types of fruits that I think you should grow, but also the varieties within them. And so over the years now of growing fruit for a good amount of time and really testing a lot of different fruits and a lot of different varieties within those fruits, I think I have a pretty good authority on some great recommendations for you guys. I know this is the perfect time for everybody out there to start thinking about, well, what is it that you want to grow next year? Not only for your garden, but what do you want to plant in your backyard orchard? What are the permanent perennials that you want to put in your backyard orchard? Now's the time to start planting thinking about this stuff, and also the perfect time to start ordering from mail order nurseries. In fact, a lot of them may have already sold out of some of their products. So if you want to get ahead of the game here and you want to grow the best fruit possible, I would highly recommend some of the suggestions in this video. And so we're going to go through this article I've written here on my blog, figboss.com. This is an article I wrote uh, a couple years ago. I also put out a video very similar where I walked around my orchard, showed you guys some of my favorite fruiting plants and talked about each one. Did the same thing here in this article, but recently I updated it with this drop down menu here that you can see. And so this is the variety list that I'm recommending and the fruits that I'm recommending that you guys try or don't try in your particular temperate climate. So we have a number of different less hardy varieties of, or species of fruits here. Uh, some of these I would consider subtropical. And then of course we have more of the temperate fruits that typically you can grow a lot further north. And so we cover a, a pretty wide range of climates here that pretty much everybody in the United States can take some of this good information. And what we're gonna do, is, as I said, we're gonna go through each one of these line items and go through these different tabs I have and talk about the recommendations that I'm making. This was video, by the way, was inspired by my own backyard orchard that I just started at my girlfriend's new home. She bought a house in March and recently we did a video actually talking about the planning process, um, creating pathways, putting a garden in, putting a actually seating area, and then of course the actual planning process of me putting in all these different perennial fruiting plants that some of which not only am I recommending to you guys today, but I've also planted in her backyard orchard for her. So, um, you know, practicing what I preach here. Um, and so if you're interested in that video, that was one of the more recent videos we did. Go check that out. I'll put it in the link to the description of this video. So first up, we want to talk about plums. Uh, nectarines and pluots. These are stone fruits that, like all the stone fruits, get heavily infected by a bug called plum cacurlio. And so it's really difficult actually growing these three in particular, plums, pluots, and nectarines. Now, I know this pest is all over the United States, and the best way to fight it is actually through a spray uh, an organic spray is what I'm recommending called Surround. Now, I have not personally sprayed much of anything in my yard, even Surround. And uh, I know it works, but I just have not really brought myself to do it. Um, but if you want to have these fruits in high quality consistently, it's just something you unfortunately have to do for most of us. Now, maybe you live in a location where you get lucky. There's not a whole lot of stone fruit trees around that have proliferated the populations of Plum Cacurlio. I live down the street from an orchard. Um, also, I imagine, um, you know, if you live in a humid place like I do here in Philadelphia, these trees also really suffer with other diseases. And so brown rot is something that comes up a lot with these three fruits, mainly because of the Plum Cacurlio. The Plum Cacurlio creates bites in the fruit and entry points for the brown rot to pr proliferate in humid places. So it's actually a more difficult issue in humid climates than it is in drier climates because you don't deal with that brown rot as often. But uh, in general, I can't really recommend any of them other than maybe this green gauge plum. This is uh, undoubtedly what a lot of growers think is the best tasting plum. And so if I'm gonna go through the effort of spraying and putting all this extra care into a fruit tree, 
I want it to taste really good. And this is above and beyond. I think most people would agree is the best tasting plum. People recommend the Bavay strain of green gauge. Um, so other than that, I can't recommend really any of them um, because I've not really had much success with any of my plums at all. Again, this bug is that serious. And maybe in the first couple of years after you plant a plum, you won't have any problems and you'll think it's easy. And then all of a sudden it'll start getting a lot worse and you really won't get any until you start spraying. So that's a big little tip there for everybody. Let's move on now to peaches. Uh, my favorite peach is Red Haven. It's definitely the standard here. It's uh, extremely resistant to disease and also does really well with plum cacurlio. Um, it's reliable. It's a really nice, tasty, yellow flesh peach. But if you want to go something a little bit tastier, I would recommend either this peach here. It's called Black Boy. Uh, excuse the name. I didn't name it. It's just here on this website, and that's what it's called. Um, they should change the name. I don't know why Rain Tree still has it listed on their website as Black Boy, but uh, I think there's a new name for it. I just don't recall the name of. Uh, these. This peach here, as well as the Indian Free Peach, are what are called... Uh, blood peaches, or at least they're red fleshed peaches. There's white flesh peaches, uh, yellow fleshed peaches, and then there's even red flesh. And usually when we talk about the flavor of fruits, the color is really a determining factor. It's not the skin color, it's the flesh color. And so red flesh to me is a great combination. At least the Indian free peach that I love so much is a nice combination between the white peaches and the yellow peaches they are amazing. So I would grow either Indian Free or Black Boy. My friend Chip, uh, only a couple miles away, has a really nice Black Boy tree. And I've enjoyed some incredible peaches and preserves from his tree. Um, they are a bit more difficult to grow because they ripen later in the season. That may be good or bad in terms of plump cacurlio, but I found that Red Haven, for some reason, just is mostly unaffected by the plump cacurlio Um you know, for whatever reason that is. All right, now we move on to the apricots. This is um, the two varieties I recommend, Early Blush and Tomcot, but there's a big difference between the two, and Early Blush is by far the superior apricot in terms of flavor. Tomcot's really reliable, productive, disease-resistant. Go with that one if that's what you want. But Early Blush, I'm telling you, is a different fruit in itself almost. It's like they injected a, uh, a plum, almost like a pluot combination of an apricot and a plum, or I guess that would be called the plum cot, um, where you take some of the juiciness and amazingness of a plum, and it's just inserted into uh, an apricot. Most apricots I've found and talked about with other people kind of have this drier texture to them. And when you bite into an early blush apricot, it's like biting into a peach. It just explodes with juice and drips down your chin and almost makes a mess. So for me, this is an incredible piece of fruit. In general, apricots here at my location in Philadelphia, they, they are bothered by late frosts uh, every so often, but I find them to be actually very reliable. And so I planted, actually bought three, I think three trees of this variety recently, um, where one I think will be planted here at my regular orchard. And I think I'm planting two, or maybe it's just one at my girlfriend's place. And so anywhere I go, I'm going to be growing this fruit. It's just that good. They're also mostly unaffected by plum cacurlio. And I think that's mainly because they just ripen so quickly and they and they ripen early. So that may have something to do with it. I don't know. This tree is mostly unaffected. My, my apricots are mostly unaffected. Next up is um, the cherry tree. Uh, and by far, I think, and this is, I think widely considered white gold is one is this is one of the standards here for a reliable and productive cherry. Uh, it is tasty, but I wish it was a darker fleshed cherry. Uh, the lighter cherries here, in my opinion, are, are a little not as good as the darker fleshed ones and the darker skinned ones. Um, but it's hard to argue against this. You can also go for North Star. My uh, friends at uh, Edible Landscaping recommend North Star as a um, as a sour cherry. 
Um, and then in terms of bush cherries, this is a different species of cherry that are, of course, smaller. Uh, and interestingly enough, they don't really deal or have problems with, I've heard, with plum cacurlio like uh, the regular cherry trees do. And so that um, is a huge benefit. They're also mostly disease resistant. Um, you do have to net them. They're easier to net because they're a bush rather than a tree. They're typically smaller. They sucker a lot. They're easy to propagate. And so, you know, some of the varieties I recommend are Crimson Passion, Romeo, Juliet, and then, of course, um, some new ones that I've discovered on Edible Landscaping site is Ian and Gabe, which are white fleshed bush cherries. And what that means is they're going to be less prone to birds and squirrels. And so maybe I can get away with not netting them. Wouldn't that be nice? But uh, yeah, we'll see. Some of these for me so far have been rather unproductive, but the places where I've planted them have been very shady. And so, yeah, I, I know that they can be productive, but uh, in general, the production for these for me has been rather low. Uh, you know, they say here on Honeyberry USA, 25 pounds at year five. So that's, that's hopeful. Um, and I think that's always been the main question with, uh, with these types of cherries. Now we have, excuse me, now we have the raspberry. And like I was talking about with the flesh of different fruits being a different color, the raspberry comes in like five different colors. There's pink, yellow, red, purple, and black. The black raspberry, in my opinion, is king for flavor. They are very, very good. Uh, if I was going to go with a different color, I would choose the red and I would choose Caroline. But I would also plant both. I like the fact that the black raspberries fruit on the floricanes, whereas Caroline is mainly a primocane variety and uh, will fruit heavily in the fall. So it's good to have both, one of each. Um, and yeah, they uh, fill that gap nicely at different times of the year. Then we have, um, you know, I think I skipped ahead in terms of the raspberries. Because where are the blackberries? Well, I think we're going now here to the pears. So for me, I am really a big fan of Asian pears. And I said here in the in the article that Chijuro is the one that I've gone with. It's done well for me. I've tasted actually some cotton candy flavor in them. Uh, if you really get them well ripened, you thin the tree well, there's a lot of sunlight getting into the tree and hitting the fruits. They're really, really tasty. But I think there's a lot of options. I don't think it necessarily matters. You just want to choose one that is uh, disease resistant to uh, fire blight. And so if you're in that area with fire blight, that's the main concern. Same thing with the European pears. If you got fire blight in your area, you're not going to have a lot of fun growing pears. If you don't and you choose the right variety let's say that is resistant you're going to have a, a very easy time growing pears in fact they are very easy if you can just solve that one issue and so for me varieties like uh, harrow sweet have done really well um i would also recommend commies it is by far my favorite pear to eat uh it has this amazing buttery texture to it and so some people really like um, Seckle is another one that's called the sugar pear. Um, I planted that at my girlfriend's orchard uh, or will plant it at my girlfriend's orchard. And my plan to that with those pears is to actually preserve them and, um, and can them in syrup. And there's a process called uh, crema di mostarda, they call it in Italy, where they preserve pears uh, in a very special way. It's a it's a quite a long process and the pears absorb all that syrup right into their flesh. They remain firm and then they put a little bit of mustard in there and it is so, it is unbelievably good. Um, Magnus is one of the, I think, children of commies and it's supposed to be better. It's actually a cross of Seckle and commies, which is pretty, pretty amazing. And so this is supposed to be a really, really good pear. Uh, the problem with it is that it, it's a little bit difficult. It's not self-fertile and does not provide pollen to other varieties. So if you're going to plant this one, you need another 
uh, another couple pairs. And for me, actually, I think my Magnus has never even flowered, let alone, you know, talk about viable pollen. So, it, you know, that could be a problem with my sunlight and the type of pruning I'm doing. But uh, in general, you know, th this is another option for me, at least, that I'm I'm recommending because of that amazing flavor. So now we're moving on to apples, and there's a lot of apples that exist. I mean, there's thousands of varieties. It's hard to choose from one, but in general, if you look around and do some research, there are definitely apples that are far superior in flavor and eating experience to others, and those are the ones I would mainly focus on. They are, of course, prone to disease and prone to pests, but, you know... If you can, again, have maybe you have to spray some. Um, you know, disease for most of us is not typically an issue uh, unless you're in a really humid place. So maybe you want to focus on that. But for me, again, if I'm going to put a lot of effort into growing apples, just like the plums, I am going to grow the best tasting ones. And so I had gone to the grocery store a couple years ago. I think it may have been last year and tasted this apple at my local grocery store. And it is red fleshed, as you can see. It's incredible. Um, now, I also tried the the other one here. I think it's called Lucy Rose. It's not nearly as good. They should not sell that apple, in my opinion. But Lucy Glow is very good. I found out here on Gurney's that they're actually selling it. So I bought one, and we're gonna plant um, Lucy Glow. And yeah, it's gonna be exciting to have a red fleshed apple because, you know, Varieties like Golden Russet, you know, King David, as I mentioned here, Gravenstein. I'm actually a big fan of Gold Rush. Uh, these are great apples, but the red flesh is really where apples are going. And Skill Colt, as an example, he has a YouTube channel as well on, on YouTube, and he has been doing this amazing apple breeding progress, process, um, apple breeding that I've been following along on his channel for a couple of years now. And uh, I'm also probably going to hopefully order some Scion from him and get myself some other red fleshed, probably better tasting apples than Lucy, um, Lucy Glow. But uh, that's kind of where I'm going is that if I'm going to grow an apple, uh, it's going to be one of these red fleshed ones. It's not a visual thing. It really, they do really just taste better in my opinion. Um, they have this amazing berry flavor to them. And uh, that, to me, makes an apple so much tastier and so much more complex. Um, so, yeah, um, that's where we're at with the apples. Uh, we talked about European pears, Asian pears. So now we're going on to the pawpaw. And let's get rid of some of these tabs so we can figure out where we're going here a little bit easier. We won't delete the raspberry. Okay, now, I don't really have a preference of a variety of pawpaw. By the way, I pretty much every fruit that I've mentioned so far, I think you should grow. I mean, I'll mention it at some point here. If we get to one, there is a couple here that I don't recommend anyone growing uh, just yet. But in general, all these fruits, I would say, yes, you should try to grow it. Um you know, I think there's a good reason for all for having all of these fruits personally. And the beauty of having all these different fruits is not only can you not get them at the grocery store at this quality, maybe you'll never find them without growing them, uh, but also you just in general have such a diversity that allows you to have a more consistent, reliable harvest that you can harvest food all year round um, and even preserve a lot of it. I mean, the beauty of like things like pears and apples and persimmons, they're you know, either on the tree into the fall or into the winter time, or you can store them for a very long time and have food. Other other fruits, you can just freeze them. You know, I'm eating smoothies right now with, you know, yogurt and a little bit of honey, but then I throw in all this frozen fruit and just blend that up that I've harvested from the year and froze, and now I get to enjoy it, you know, when it's not the growing season. It's cold outside. That's why I'm inside right now. Um, so... Yeah, I think uh, in terms of, you know, the pawpaw, you should definitely grow a pawpaw. Now, I don't know necessarily, based on the varieties available, which one really is better. There doesn't seem to be that much of a consensus. There doesn't seem to be that much of a difference in terms of 
all the different varieties. It's mainly about size and and seed size and fruit to flesh ratio, fruit to pit ratio, and uh, or fruit, or fruit to seed ratio, and uh, you know some maybe a little bit more bitter, or a little bit of this flavor. But I don't think so far the diversity is there uh, like you'll find in other fruits, like maybe apples or figs or mangoes as an example so if i'm wrong then that's cool because then there's a whole world of pawpaw to experience but you know i have a mango and a pa golden and they taste incredible um but sunflower here if you were going to plant just one would probably be the one i would plant because it's supposed to be um self-fertile now if you plant another you're going to get a lot more fruit and i probably would just plant two regardless i even planted two in the same hole. My PA Golden and Mango are both in the same hole. So there's no problem with pollination. And uh, that way it's just one tree and it actually works and solves the issue of, you know, having multiple varieties. You could also do some grafting. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of options here, but again, I just wanted to bring that up to your attention. Now we're moving on to the raspberry, I think finally. And again, we talked about that, but now we'll talk about blackberries and so my favorite blackberry is not actually a blackberry it's a cross i think between a, a raspberry and a type of blackberry and they named it marionberry uh, it says right here developed at oregon state crossing a chelhalem chehalem blackberry uh loganberry which is a cross between the blackberry and the raspberry and then a raspberry so it has a hybrid in there uh oh even then with a lallyberry there's another blackberry cross. So there's a lot of kind of blackberries and raspberries in this fruit. Let's just say that. Um, and so essentially this to me is really a marriage of the two. It's like eating a, a blackberry, but it has the most amazing raspberry flavor. And to me, it's a better eating experience because I'd rather actually eat a blackberry than a raspberry, but I like the flavor of a raspberry more than I like the flavor of a blackberry. So you combine the texture of the blackberry with the flavor of the raspberry, and you have really just an amazing fruit. That's it. The problem with them, uh, the marionberry, is that they're not very hardy. So if you're in a zone 7, a 7B, you might get away with it. But typically, I think this is reserved for people in zone 8s or higher. Um, other options include Columbia Star, which is supposed to be similar to the marionberry but hardier so far it is hardier but i can't comment just yet even though i've tasted it twice in a row i've had problems with my canes from this plant um i can't confirm that it does actually you know taste and have a similar eating experience to the marionberry there are others called black diamond triple crowns a standard for the flora cane crop and then also there's olympic berry a number of different varieties i'm trialing here to see if something will work itself out. Black Diamond's supposed to have a really good reputation for flavor. And then of course there's the Loganberry, which is I think what most people would agree is the best cross between a blackberry and a raspberry. Um, you know, it's a trailing blackberry. I think it's also thornless. So for me, that's a nice little benefit. If any of the blackberries like the Marionberry have thorns, it's like the one devil plant in your yard. And I don't want to really deal with it. Um, you have to wear gloves. You can't get away with it. Every year I get pricked by them. And so um, that's, I guess, one benefit of the Loganberry. And also I think Columbia Star is, uh, is also thornless. Um, all right. So then we've got Jewel here. Again, we talked about the raspberries. Jewel or Bristol is a nice choice for a black variety, and Caroline's a good choice for the red varieties. And again, to me, that's kind of where I would um, put my money is in the Marionberry, um, Caroline, and also in Jewel or Bristol. Uh, the others are still a bit unproven. Oh, of course, Triple Crown, which is uh, a standard. Now let's move on to the blueberries. Um, I've tried a bunch of different blueberries. I can't really say I've tried many of them um, enough to really, I would say, recommend or say that Drapper is the best tasting. But to me, it is the best tasting I have. Um, and I find it to be incredible in terms of its flavor. And let me see here. It says here... Uh, 
uh, I've read it somewhere uh, on a different website that it is a, a good tasting blueberry. Um, and so for me, I have to obviously concur. Uh, and to me, it kind of has like this antioxidant polyphenol flavor that you can taste. It's just different than really most of the other blueberries I grow is that you can taste this amazing, just what seems so complex and and exquisite flavor that you'll never really taste in other blueberries. And I'm sure some others probably have it. Um, I've actually tasted something similar in some fig varieties that I grow. Um, and so to me, I think it's really special to, uh, to have this particular blueberry. Uh, and I would recommend it above, again, all the others. Um, here's Che. And again, I don't, this is one of the fruits, uh, the few fruits on this list I would say don't grow. Um, it typically um, has not had great reviews in terms of flavor. I was just so curious to find out what it tastes like. And I know people who have fruited this and, you know, edible landscaping as an example is probably one of the biggest promoters of this fruit and say that it's self-fertile, doesn't need a male, it takes a long time. You know, what is the secret? How can I get my fruit to actually, um, or should I say, get my che to actually fruit? And the answer to me is just not very clear. So I don't have any super secret techniques. I don't really have anything uh, uh, up my sleeve other than just waiting. And to me, I've waited a long time. It probably just needs a male and uh yeah i just i just would not wait for i don't recommend waiting such a long time for a fruit that may inevitably not be very tasty i mean you know it's just crazy to think that it's not going to taste good um let me just adjust my camera here in case it's been frozen let me just do one thing here and see what happens doesn't appear to be working. If you guys can see me, then that's great. But on my end, it's frozen. And so I just want to see what happens here. Hold on. Let me turn it off and back on. Okay, we're back on my end anyway. I don't know if it was fine for you guys. Okay, let's move on now. And we're moving over to the strawberries. There's two types of strawberries that I would recommend. Um, this is Mara de Bois, your typical normal strawberry you'd find at the store. And then there's also the alpine strawberry. And the alpines are very small, soft, very fragrant, incredibly flavored. They almost taste fake. And to me, they are, without a doubt, this species of strawberry is the best tasting out of all of them. Now, you do sacrifice in size, but it is highly worth growing, in my opinion. And I've almost switched completely to these Alpine strawberries. I am going to plant more Mar de Bois here. I'm going to probably order some in the next couple of weeks from this website here in Norse. This is where I've gotten mine in the past. I've also given away a lot um, to friends in the area because it is an amazing strawberry. Um, and so if I was going to plant a regular old strawberry, this is the one I would plant. It not only produces a nice crop in the spring, but also picks up then again in August and fruits all the way until frost. So it's really nice. It's just the white alpine strawberry, not only does it taste better, but I find that they, um, and this is the main reason why I've switched over to them, is that they also are basically problem free. Nothing knows that they exist. They're white. The animals, groundhogs, birds, squirrels, don't even know that they're there. Uh, but they'll always go after, you know, the red strawberries. So, um, you know, for me, and even the slugs don't really bother them, which is incredible as well. So uh, to me, they're problem free and they taste better, you know, and I eat them pretty much almost perfect every single time. Um and so, yeah, to me, it's just a, it seems like a no brainer, but those are the varieties there. I would recommend there is a lot of different varieties of Alpine strawberry and, um, you could experiment with it. Uh, but the white varieties typically are supposed to be more fragrant and have 
uh, a better flavor, but the red ones I've had in the past and they're also very good. So don't, don't be discouraged from the red varieties. Uh, then we have mulberries. Um, there's two varieties I'm growing uh, that I would recommend. One is called Girardi. This is a really dwarf mulberry that produces a ton of fruit. And to me, it's the standard. If you're going to grow a mulberry at home, you got to plant this one because it's just smaller. You know, the other mulberries, they grow so quickly that you will just have a giant tree in no time. And it's impossible in the net. The birds love them. Squirrels love them. You know, it's just a problem if you're going to grow this fruit because you can't protect it. Uh, you know, if you're going to grow a fruit, you have to be able to protect it. You have to have some kind of strategy. Uh, you know, otherwise you need to be in this big commercial orchard, you know, and that's a different scenario. But in a backyard setting, basically, if I don't net everything, I don't really get to enjoy it. So, and it's better to net it to discourage different animals and critters to come along so that they don't come back and think, oh, here's food and keep coming back. Um, so, you know, you don't want to plant something like this that's only going to encourage a lot of animals in the area to be all over your yard. Instead, you plant the dwarf Girardi, which only really gets to six by six, and you have a really nice tree that, by the way, is very productive, but also fruits over, I would argue, a very long period. And so that's a nice little benefit right there is the harvest window. Um, I find they're good. And, uh, yeah, can't complain about it. There's also a variety called weeping and I planted that one, uh, at my girlfriend's place and we're going to see how that one does. And of course, because it's weeping, it should have a better size to it. And, uh, yeah, we'll find out. All right. Moving on to grapes. These are Labrusca and vernifera, vernifera type grapes, um, and to me, I find there's a bunch of them that I've grown over the years. Some of them have been very disappointing. Others, like Mars and Everest Seedless, seem to be quite good. These are Concord grape types, and uh, they're quite reliable and disease-resistant here. And that's something you really have to pay attention to. If you're growing grapes in humid places, you have to pay attention to their disease uh ratings and so you can go on double a vineyards here they're really some of the best people to get vines from because you can go here and look at their disease susceptibility and you'll see where these things are rated and so you basically want if you have a lot of powdery mildew you want to make sure you choose a variety that's resistant uh all of my my yard mostly gets black rot but there's a way actually if you just bag grapes you can prevent black rot completely and so one of the worst things i get is um well it is black rot yeah because the black rot hits the leaves and destroys the leaves but then also affects the fruits but if you can uh you know have varieties that are somewhat i guess resistant to black rot and don't totally defoliate in addition to having mildews uh, then all you have to worry about is the fruits. And so that's kind of what happens here in my yard. And so uh, I'm not really concerned too much about these mildews like other people might have to be. And so I, I can get away with, thankfully, choosing other varieties. But, um, you know, there's a quite a, a big diversity of grapes, and I've listed a lot of them here. I didn't realize there were so many different types of grapes beyond, you know, these conquer types that you could grow um reliably and so reliance jupiter saturn marquise golden muscat compassion these are some recommendations and and vines that i've heard about and and i'm growing now here in uh in my climate so if you want to not worry about disease which i don't blame you um you would want to grow a muscadine grape and so i have here in my yard lane and triumph and these are the two varieties I would recommend because most muscadines are not very hardy below zero degrees Fahrenheit, where Lane and Triumph is supposed to be rated all the way down to negative 10. And I have found firsthand, at least so far, that they are quite hardy to my zone 7A climate. Um, well, I don't think actually they've been tested um, by something extreme just yet, now that I think about it. But this is what uh, reports are. 
that I've read from other growers. So anyway, um, these are the two varieties I would recommend. I enjoy Lane more than Triumph. Um, I think it tastes a lot better, but in general, you don't have to spray them. They're disease free. The leaves are basically perfect and they're extremely productive and I really enjoy eating them. Isons is probably the perfect, uh, best place to get muscadines from. All right, now we're moving on to currants, the Ribe family. There's gooseberries in the family, and then they've crossed gooseberries with currants to form yosta berries. In terms of currants, I would say the Crandall clove currant is beyond the best tasting currant. It is by far, uh, in my opinion, the best tasting. It has the best eating quality, and to me, it's got some of that currant in there, but it's kind of like you're eating a gooseberry in a way. Um, in terms of, let's say the sweetness and balance of acidity and, you know, uh, tartness and sourness and all that, um, Crandall actually has a good fresh eating experience, but in the current form or package, let's say. Um, and I really, really enjoy them. I planted two of these at my girlfriend's place. I think I may have even planted another one here after tasting it just for the first time last season. Um, now, if you want to plant some gooseberries, there are a number of varieties, Hinomaki Red, Hinomaki Yellow, uh, Black Velvet. These are all that are supposed to have a, a really good flavor uh, in terms of their gooseberries. But I have found it's not really about the flavor. It's actually about the texture with these. Um, some of the other gooseberries I've grown in the past, like Poor Man, and um, there's a couple others I'm not thinking of the names of. They're almost like, um, well, it, it kind of happens when they become overripe is they kind of turn into a pear. They're almost grainy. Uh, but in general, I have not found good results outside of the Hinomaki varieties. Hinomaki Yed's re uh, yellow, excuse me, is very good. And Hinomaki red, I find, is also very good. But I, I think I prefer the yellow. Um, you do have to worry about with these plants, uh, it seems like so far the gooseberries affected more, um, than others is caterpillars eating the leaves. And I, I actually killed or lost my Hinomaki red to caterpillars. So you kind of watch out for that. Um, then of course there's the Oris 8 Yosta berry. Uh, it says gooseberry here on one green world, but it says it's a hybrid between a black currant and a gooseberry, which is should be just called a yosta berry. I don't know what, what the difference is there, but, um, you know, as they say here, um, orisate is considered the best eating, uh, of any gooseberry. Um, I think it's probably should be changed. Maybe they mean the fr best for fresh eating of any yosta berry. Uh, I haven't tasted it yet. Uh, I planted one, I think, last year. But um, what I can tell you is that of the Yosta berries I grow and recommend, I've tried the red and black varieties. And the black is, I think, that's the one that I enjoy eating. It's not great. But um, like the black currants, they're difficult to eat. Um, you know, I don't recommend any of the black currants other than Crandall. Um, I think you can eat pink champagne fresh. I enjoy it. Red Lake is a really good one, and I find they're really nice in fruit salads, and I'm going to actually plant this one again. I've had such good success with it in the past, but because I couldn't eat it fresh and wanted room for other things, I, I ripped them out. Um, so Oris 8 might be uh, you know, just the better Yosta berry. We'll see what happens with that, but there's a lot to choose from in this family, and, and I would recommend growing all three of them and at least one variety from each. I think there's a lot of difference and uses from each one and, you know, uh, different things you can use with them and they all taste different. They're all, you know, different fibers, give you different nutrients. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of benefits there. Uh, in terms of quince, I didn't, um, create a, a link here for you guys. Uh, I don't really have a recommendation on a variety. And so for that reason, um, they're supposed to be good for paste. Um, you know, a lot of people take the quince and create almost like a jam out of them or like a jelly is probably more accurate. And that's supposed to be very good with different products and cheese and bread and all kinds of nice charcuterie type stuff. But, uh, 
you know, I made myself some. I bought some quince at the at the grocery store recently, and I was not really impressed by it. So maybe there's something I didn't do right, but it's typically the same recipe I would use for jam, and to me, it just it just wasn't wasn't very good. So um, we'll see if that changes. Not sure uh, what to think just yet, but I can't really recommend a variety for for that reason. Um, they're kind of like eating a uh, an astringent pear is how I think about them if you're going to eat them fresh. So they're not very good to eat fresh. You have to process them. Uh, in terms of honeyberries, this is a really misunderstood fruit, and Honeyberry USA does a great job of talking about them and, and researching the different varieties and recommending different varieties. Aurora is the, the top dog. Um, I've talked to Burnus there. She's a really nice woman, and she recommended, of course, Aurora as well as another one called uh, Blue Banana, which I had not heard of. Uh, I read the description on Strawberry Sensation on their website. I ordered one. I thought that looked really good. Um, I think at the current moment, I don't have a Strawberry Sensation anymore. I think it may have it may have died on me. Um, but in general, these uh, these three, I think, are really good recommendations, and uh, without a doubt, uh, they're really, really nice fruits. Uh, people don't understand them and they don't know how to pick them. And so for me, you know, if I was going to choose honeyberry over quince, I would definitely choose honeyberry. In fact, not only, you know, maybe is quince not one that I really recommend right now, uh, with a lack of understanding, but, um, you know, I would highly recommend you guys try and grow honeyberries they do need you do need two and you want to find some that that flower at this at the right time in fear of late frosts they need a a cooler climate more northern you know you need a, a really moist soil they're not drought tolerant at all so mulch is the the key there uh but for me again they're one of the top fruits on this list and i think they're amazing in so many different ways fresh processing you name it um, we skipped over, by the way, I just noticed we skipped over the goji berry. Uh, this to me is inedible. <laughs> Don't recommend the goji berry. I did a video on it years ago. It was one of the first fruits I grew and it is terrible. In fact, I, just a funny story. I remember I gave my brother some, he thought I poisoned him. Uh, that's how bad it was. I even saw a bird one time take a peck and eat, uh, a goji berry and then spit it out. Like it was like, you know, out of its beak, just couldn't believe how bad it was. So, <laughs> so they're, they're not good. There's also the, the black OG berry. Someone reached out to me about recently and that's on Baker Creek's website. I think you get seeds of it, but a lot of people will complain that they're tasteless and watery. Uh, I guess that's an upgrade from, uh, the red varieties. Uh, and there's two species of red, uh, goji berries. I think it's lych, uh, lyceum, Babarum is the species that you want, and Chinense is the really, really, really bad one. So you got to be careful if you are going to grow them, grow the right species. Um, if you want them for medicinal purposes, I guess that's a different thing, but, you know, they can't be that medicinal. Sorry. <laughs> it's not worth it. <laughs> All right. Um, so here we go. Uh, let's see. We went over the honeyberries, yosta berries, the ribes, quince. So now we're on to Juneberry. And so we're getting now closer to the end of fruits that, um, well, these are some of the newer fruits I've been growing. Um, Gumi I've been growing for a number of years, but uh, I've lined it up here with autumn olive for a reason. But the Juneberry is an amazing fruit. And when you look at them, you think about uh, a blueberry. I mean, this website, unfortunately, on uh, Edible Landscaping, they don't have a picture of the fruit, but they look just like blueberries. There are different names for them, serviceberry, juneberry, Saskatoon, um, you know, and they look just like blueberries. But when you eat them... Uh, you know, I find they're more like eating a dried cherry, especially when they're ripe. They have a, a, f um, a dried fruit flavor, like you're eating a fig or a date or a dried cherry combined with uh, some nice acidity and sweetness. And for me, they're, they're actually really good. There's some seeds in them, and some people don't like that. 
Uh, it's like a seedy. It's like the eating experience, though, of eating a seedier blueberry, but the flavor is very different. And yeah, for me, I was recommended Autumn Brilliance um, after researching about it and talking to the guys at uh, Edible Landscaping. But there's a seedling nearby um, that a friend of mine and I have been eating off of uh, this tree and trying to propagate. It's actually very, very good. Um, shout out to my friend Chris who found that seedling by his, by his work. Um, and there's also a seedling that was given to me um, as a gift many years ago by Steve. Shout out to Steve. Um, all right, so then we have Gumi. Um, we might as well just keep going in order here. And Carmine is the variety I recommend. I've been recommending this fruit for years. It's very underrated. Not many people know about it. But the more I keep talking about it, the more it's picking up, and a lot of people are starting to grow it, which is awesome. You know, that's kind of the point of this video at some point. You know, I'm recommending all these different fruits and different varieties. This might completely change your opinion about a particular fruit. You know, uh, a lot of people don't like honeyberries, as an example, and that's mainly because they don't know when to pick them. You know, you have to learn a lot about these fruits. You know, for me, I don't like quince in this current moment. And that's maybe because I don't know how to process it properly. You know, it has to be processed. You have to learn how it is that you use these fruits. And if you don't have the right, you know, education, um, you may just be totally turned off. And if you choose the wrong variety as well, you could be totally turned off. You know, one fig variety, I've always said this because I talk so much about figs, that they are not created equal at all, and they're highly subjected to their environment, more so than most of the fruits here on this list. Uh, almost all the fruits on this list, actually. So if you want to choose, you know, the right variety, it's going to just take, it's going to go a long way to you even maybe, maybe you don't even enjoy the fruit versus actually really loving it. And so that's the thing. Um, and that's where I'm at with quince. That's where a lot of people are at with, Honeyberries, but I promise you, if you choose the right varieties on this list, they're so good. Every single one of them that I've given a positive thumbs up for. I mean, it's just hard to, you know, for me in my life, never grow them again. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to grow every single fruit on here that I've recommended probably to the day I die. Um, Tillamook is another name for carmine. And so, yeah, like I said, you you really should try them. You really should grow it. This is, in my opinion, one of the tastier fruits that you've never even heard of, and it's just, in general, one of the tastiest fruits on this entire list. Um, now, because it's so tasty, I decided to try the autumn olive, which is related to the gumi plant. They're both nitrogen fixers, and they're so easy to grow as well. They even can grow in a lot of shade, and so I picked up this one here called ruby. Uh, from Burnt Ridge. Shout out to the guys at Burnt Ridge. Uh, Michael Dolan, I think his name is. That guy's doing some awesome work. And so in general, um, you know, this is by far, I think, uh, would seem to be the most promising variety. Maybe this will get me interested more in autumn olives uh, if this one tastes good. And that's what I'm hoping for this year is to get a decent taste of it. And we'll kind of go from there. It just makes sense to me that if the gumi tastes good, well, you know, the autumn olive has a decent shot, and I've heard Michael Dolan speak flavor uh, favorably of it in terms of its flavor. So I'm, you know, I'm a little high on it. I wouldn't say super high on it, but, yeah, I, I think it's probably worth trialing if you wanted to try something new. Uh, hardy kiwi, or kiwi in general, I think a lot of people don't know that they can grow a lot of kiwi. There's a lot of different uh, kiwi species that are accessible to most of us in the United States. There's three different main species. The hardy kiwi is the one that I think a lot of people grow in the United States, and these are incredible. They're like kiwi berries. Um, if you haven't tried one, you can find them a lot at a lot of farmer's markets in the fall if you have a really well-respected orchard by you. It, it, I know it's pretty popular in like South the middle of Pennsylvania towards the south. Um, I forget the names of the counties over there. Uh, but they have a lot of orchards in that part of Pennsylvania. And uh, they grow actually a lot of kiwi. There's some of the original kiwi growers there that tried to make this fruit uh, popular. And so I actually get them here 
quite a bit at, at farmers markets. Um, but this is one that I wish I had more space for because you need a really big and strong trellis for kiwi vines. So the, the main variety people grow is called Anna and you need a male. But Asai here is a self-fertile variety, at least they say. And so you may only need this one single vine. So I've planted it myself. We'll see what happens. I don't know. I'm not really banking on it. I actually planted one of these years ago. It was one of the first plants I, I planted, and it didn't really do well. It uh, it grew, but it, it had a lot of problems with disease on the leaves. And so that's worrying for me. Um, it could be a, a moisture problem, but eventually this thing should you know, eventually pick up and, and do well. Um, at least I'm hoping that I can give it a long enough of a shot. And the cool thing about this vine is it's smaller, doesn't need as much of a trellis. You can prune it, you know, as a, as a, a hedge or a bush rather than a, a big vine that is just so laden and heavy with, uh, with fruit. So that's the one I would probably recommend other than Anna. Here's the Viking Aronia berry. This is a, I don't really have a recommendation on, on the variety, but this is the one I chose. The thing with the Aronias is they're very flavorful, nutritious. I actually really enjoy eating them, but they can be very astringent. They are called the choke berry for a reason. Uh, and that astringency is something that I've actually learned to really enjoy more in fruits. Uh, you know, Gumi has a bit of it. Once it ripens fully, it, it's almost gone or gone completely. You know, persimmons, the astringent types are some of my favorite fruits. And I think a little bit of astringency in your food is actually, in my opinion, enjoyable. But uh, if it's going to be as astringent as these aronia berries are that I've tasted, then I'm not going to enjoy them. But I've heard mixed results. Maybe I can let them hang on the vine or on the bush, excuse me for an extended period of time and see if that astringency will lessen and go away. And that's what I'm mainly doing this experiment for. Cause I, I do actually really enjoy eating. I've had this fruit and seen big bushes of it, uh, over in Princeton at another person's backyard orchard. So we're trying it. We'll see what happens. Elegant Cornelian cherry. Shout out to the guy who recommended me this. I don't know who that was. Sorry. Uh, but this is one particularly nice for fresh eating out of all the Cornelian cherries. And I haven't tasted it yet, but we're going to find out. I don't really know too much about it other than it's fairly easy to grow. Um, so far, I'm actually struggling with uh, something eating the, the leaves. I think it might be a groundhog or some kind of animal that likes the taste of the leaves. Uh, here is lingonberry. My friend Big Bill is a big fan of these. Uh, I actually think of these in a very similar way to the red currant. You know, you don't really necessarily love them fresh. I find these are actually better fresh, but they have a strong acidity that pairs well with meats. And I actually find they would be really good in a fruit salad as well. I planted some of these at the new orchard. I don't really recommend a particular variety just yet, but I did plant corral. All right, here's a plant called a sea berry. And someone brought this to my attention is this variety here called Golden Sweet because the problem with the sea berry is that it's not very good fresh. You have to preserve it. Think of it the same way you would think of a black currant um, or a red currant. You know, you, you're not going to really want to eat them fresh. Maybe you can put them in a fruit salad. I've never tasted them. Um, and the reason I haven't grown them at all is because they also need a pollinator. But apparently... This golden sweet variety is the sweetest. Um, so, you know, if you're going to choose one, this is probably the one that I will choose at some point here in the future. Some of you guys have recommended wintergreen. And I got to uh, one of these in the mail from One Green uh, World recently, and it had fruit on it. And I got to taste it fully ripe. And I have to say, they do taste just like wintergreen candy. And some people like that, and I think it's interesting. Uh, to me, I thought it was it was good, but it's not something I really want to eat very often. You know, um, I don't know. There's something about it that I was like, this is, you know, the flavor is nice, but I'm just not really into it. And something that I would want to come back to. So I almost feel like I bought this and really don't enjoy it. 
Uh, but we're going to give it more time, of course, and see, you know, exactly what the deal is in the future. But, uh, you know, not something I would recommend in this current moment. Um, now, here's a Huckleberry. Now, this thing is also kind of similar to blueberries. I've never had a, a Huckleberry before. Uh, my girlfriend really is into, I mean, they look just like blueberries. Look at that. She's into huckleberry pie. So I, I bought one, never tried it. And let's just plant one. I've heard good things. You know, it's about time that we try it and give it a shot. And so that's kind of where I'm at with, uh, with this one. It does need acidic soil, which is one thing that does concern me with the lingonberries, blueberries, huckleberries, maybe even this wintergreen needs a acidic soil. You know, um, so that can be difficult for some people. Uh, but if you get that right, uh, you know, it just is a breeze typically growing most of these fruits. So we're getting to the end. We're getting close. Um, I did skip over elderberry. Before we move on to the subtropical fruits that are a little bit less hardy or, let's say, uh, meant for warmer, typically drier places than where I live, uh, the elderberry is certainly one that I would, I would definitely recommend. Um, and I don't really have a variety that I could recommend because I'm not sure it really matters just yet. You know, people plant seedlings, uh, you know, they're easy to propagate also by cutting. Uh, there are some standard, really nice varieties. I think one's called, uh, John Adams. And, uh, there's, there's a few varieties. I'm sure if you look around, it's hard to go wrong with that. But what's cool about them is that they're, you know, you can make them in the jams, preserves, syrups. They're very healthy, full of vitamin C. Um, you can't eat them fresh. They are poisonous. So that's the one plant on this list that is actually produces poisonous berries. Uh, but if you process them and cook them, they are then at that point edible. Um, but the the nice thing about them, I find, is they're just so easy to grow. You know, a lot of these berries are very easy to grow. And I think that's an underrated thing that most people don't think about. You know, you plant one of these perennials, any of the berries that I've mentioned, you get them somewhat established, you got fruit for the rest of your life, or at least a very long period of time, and with very little care. You know, there's no reason to buy most of these berries at the grocery store. And so elderberries are really expensive nowadays. Ever since the, the pandemic, People really are into that, um, trying to use it as a valuable health food. And so you would not believe how easy they are to grow. And to get, by the way, very large harvests of, of elderberry. So um, they also flower very late, and there's almost no chance of, uh, of late frost hitting them. They are probably the most reliable food source, I think, in my entire yard. And that's, I think, saying something. All right. Uh, so that is the temperate fruits. Let's move on to the subtropical fruits. We've got pomegranates, persimmons, citrus, and the jujube left, and then we're done. Um, hopefully you guys have had some really nice recommendations so far that you're going to use in planting your garden. I love hearing at some point in the future, someone always, I get occasional messages of people who, you know, really uh, took a recommendation of mine, planted it, loved it, and came back to me a year or two or so many years later and said, Ross, this was a really nice recommendation. Thank you. Um, you know, that's that to me is uh, is what makes this video all worth it, in my opinion. So pomegranates, we recently and, and we recently published a video on my pomegranate journey. It's been a long one. You can grow them in pots, and you can also grow them in maybe as low as six B. Uh, depending on the variety. Salavatsky here in 7A has done really well, fruited it last year for the first time. Takes a while. Um, I'm also now seeing success with them in containers. There's a bit of some lessons I've learned, but you, they're one of the fruits I think it's worth growing in containers if uh, you, know, you can't plant them outside. Uh, most of the things, by the way, on this list can also be grown in containers. You know, There's no limit, but because most of these temperate fruits can just be planted in the ground, you know, there's no reason not to just plant them in the ground unless, of course, you don't have any space. If you're forced to grow on a balcony or you're forced to grow somewhere really shady or you don't have any land, you know, growing any of these things in a container is going to work out. You just have to choose the right pot size. You have to feed it really well. 
and you also have to make sure you have good soil and proper watering practices. Once you get that down, I mean, you can grow anything you want in a container and all the rules basically of growing each plant individually in containers are basically the same, except for some of the plants may need a trellis. Some of them may, may need a different soil pH. Maybe you want to adjust the nutrients slightly or the soil mix slightly, but you basically can do the same thing for every single plant in a container and it's just brainless. You just make sure you have the right formula and you're golden. I'm telling you, it's that easy. And then, of course, I guess you have to think about overwintering it, which is also rather easy depending on your, you know, what you have available to you um, and also where you live. Some of these things that are, they're just so hardy, you could leave them outside all winter time. I've done that with a lot of these plants in containers um, when I first started and, and it worked out great. So uh, let's see here. Let's move on now to the subtropical fruits, uh, as I said, and and like I, yeah, that's what I was saying. The pomegranate you could grow in a container where if you can't, you don't live in a, a zone, let's say seven B, or you know, really you can grow them in a seven A if Salabotsky. I've also planted Serevni here, and I'm gonna plant I think Kazake, and there's another one I have that I'm planning on planting as well as I think Sumbar. So I'm going to really go all in with these pomegranates and plant them in the ground. They're, of course, easier to deal with in the ground. There's less work, less fertilizer, less water, less care, less money involved. But if you needed to grow them in containers like this Parfianca, which is supposed to be the best tasting pomegranate, there's two others I, I have that are supposed to be very good. This is, of course one of the three that I would grow in a container and put the a little bit of extra effort in, like we talked about with the plums, you know, like we talked about with the apples. If I'm going to grow it and it's going to take a little bit of extra care, I want to grow the best tasting ones. And so Parfianca fits that that bill. Some bar is very early. I think to me that's a huge benefit um, for a lot of people. Salavatsky is supposed to be very hardy. So far it, it is. Serevni is supposed to be very hardy, mostly unproven so far. And uh, there's some others here that I'm going to trial in the ground that are supposed to be hardy, like uh, this one here called Kazake. Okay, persimmons. This is actually my favorite fruit beyond uh, the fig. I know some people think I'm crazy for saying that because um, I obsess so much about the fig tree. By the way, we're not talking about the fig tree in this video. I have so many other recommendations you guys can look at and watch videos of or read about on my blog that we're not going to cover that in today's video. Um, but Brock is probably my go-to because if you're going to eat them fresh, there's three ways I think you can enjoy persimmons. The The best way, let's go back a second. The best way to enjoy them is hoshigaki, which means you grow a variety like haichia, an Asian variety like Haichia, Giambo, or Jiro. You peel the skin, you dip them in, in boiling water, and then you air dry them for about 30 days. It's the best dried fruit on the planet. Uh, I really love dates, really love dried figs. I love dried fruit like you would not believe. Um, to me, it's the best tasting dried fruit. And uh, that's how I like to enjoy them the most. Now, you could maybe do this with Seijo. I'm not really certain on that. If that's a persimmon that's meant for it, maybe it's better to eat it fresh. Uh, but if I'm going to eat them fresh, I would like to grow proc or a persimmon that ripens all of them prior to frost. They're going to taste better that way. And then you have persimmons like Rosianca and Tecumseh, which ripen their persimmons into the wintertime. I have persimmons still on my tree. It's early February. Uh, my Rosianca and um, Tecumseh is the same thing. You can get them into March and um, they're very late ripening and you can have fresh fruit into the winter time and even into the next spring, which is incredible. Um, now those I think you preserve in a way for baking purposes, perhaps, whereas Proc, um, you know, I would really like to eat them fresh. Uh, early in the season, before the hoshigaki comes in, before you dry them all, because it is an early ripening persimmon. Then you eat the hoshigaki, then you eat the persimmons on the trees that are 
out there in the wintertime. So that's my thing there with the persimmons. You can agree, you can disagree, but so far I think it's more about not necessarily the variety, but the uses of each variety and how hardy they are and then when they ripen as well. Um, all right, so then we move on to citrus. I have so many citrus recommendations. I use citrus a lot in cooking. I'd also, by the way, recommend this nursery here, Madison Citrus Nursery. This is uh, my friend Herschel's nursery. He does such a great job. I, didn't, I was like blown away when I got the plants. By far and away, I think better than Four Winds. Um, and so for me, they're probably the best place to get citrus trees from uh, if you're anywhere in the country. And um, this is one variety called uh, Decopon or uh, Shira Nui, I guess, is another name for it. But you can get these at the grocery store right now, at Whole Foods. And in my opinion, this is the best tasting fresh citrus that you can you can eat. Um, it has, a, it really does, has a nice flavor. You know, I, I actually really like, um, for anyone else that's interested, I like navels, I like caracaras, I like um, blood oranges. To me, this is better. But if I was going to go grow a blood orange, I recommend a Moa 8. That one sounds interesting. But I also use them a lot in my cooking. So things like bears, lime, Lisbon lemon, Meyer lemon. These are musts. I really like uh, Fukushu kumquats. You know, they're nice. The finger limes, I think, are, are actually live up to the hype. I really like to put them on sushi. I'd like to try this New Zealand lemonade tree to make my own lemonade. Uh, Excalibur lime, this one looked interesting. And then of course there's sudachi and yuzu. Especially yuzu is is its own amazing citrus that you can put on your food like a lime or a lemon. And until you taste it, you don't really understand it, but it is in its own category and it's awesome. It is certainly one of the best tasting citrus that you can grow, uh, you can make it in so many different products. Uh, you know, of course you can use it in the same way you use a lime or a lemon, pretty much any way you can think of. And it is just unique and amazing. Highly recommend it. There's also the Calamundin orange, which is nice. The Thomasville Citran Quat, which is supposed to be quite hardy, but Yuzu is even hardy. It's supposed to be down to zero. I'm going to plant that this year uh, against my girlfriend's house to help it get through the winter time. Then of course we have the jujube, which is last. And I have grown a lot of different jujubes, different varieties over the years. I regret to inform a lot of the lovers of jujubes that it's really not one of my favorite fruits because if you eat them fresh before they dry, they're like an apple, and I would just rather eat an apple. They're more complex, better tasting, better texture, don't have a you know this giant pit. So the only way I would justify eating a jujube is for health reasons or to eat them dried. And I just don't find myself eating them dried very often. Uh, I do dry them every year, but I don't really just go out of my way to eat them for some reason. I don't know. They're good. I enjoy eating them dried, but... That's typically how I would eat them. And I think it might be one of those fruits that then you have to really explore and process and figure out a way to use like quince to understand better before just writing it off. Because I know it's a good fruit and I agree, they're good fresh, you know, and that's what I had sugar cane and honey jar for. Um, but Lee was just the superior jujube when dried and it's meant for that. And so that's the only jujube I grow to date for the reasons mentioned. So again, those are all of the uh, recommendations there, guys. I hope if you got this far, I thank you. Please hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button for me right now. Do me that favor. Go to the blog. Check out this uh, article here if you haven't already. Like I said, I'll put it in the description. And uh, yeah, I thank everybody for watching. Hope you guys got some nice recommendations. Take care.